Yes, Diogo, we'll see yes. it. Looks good. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk about management of post-bariatic surgical leaks, fistulas, and structures. So I have no disclosure related to this talk. Yeah, so bariatric surgery, as everyone knows, is the most effective treatment for obesity and associated comorbidities. However, complications such as leaks, fistulas, and strictures can occur in about 5% in general. In, ex in centers of expertise, this rate is lower. So the mortality rate is very low, but it can happen. And the risk of death is related not to the complication itself, but with the inability to, to do the early diagnosis and to treat these patients. So we need to know the common locations. Now we have a lot of sleeve surgery, so the angle of use is now the, the most common uh, place to have the leak or the fistula. And there is a difference between leaks and fistulas. So leaks is a communication between the intra and extra luminal compartments. And fistulas, it's when you have two organs, two reptilized superfaces uh, together. So that, there is this difference. Usually the leak is associated uh, with early surgery and fistulas do it to an untreated leak. So to treat these patients, when you have uh, a leak, uh, usually it's in the early period after surgery. So you need to do a systemic treatment. We need to drain this patient and also treat the factors related to the leak. And the most important thing in my talk, as I, uh, as I consider, is the endoscopic treatment should start early. So it's very common the surgeon try to treat these patients uh, do a revisional surgery and then place a nasal feeding tube and never ask for the endoscopy. So when they call us, like before three weeks, our rate of success is every, uh, is almost 100%. So in my, in our hospital, it's 94.5%, but the literature shows also 100%. So for sure, more than 90% when you are when you are in a center of expertise. So how to treat these patients? So when you don't have a... Uh, uh, external drain, you, you need to take care. You cannot uh, disrupt the, the collection, the, the, the container collection. So never go with air because the air you're going to expand the collection and you can open the collection. Then you're going to, uh, your patient is going to be very uh, worse than he, he was. So always go underwater technique. Even CO2 sometimes is not good. So the techniques for treat the, these complications include closure, covering, and draining techniques. We're gonna talk about all, all these approaches. So glues and tissue sealants, to be honest, I don't use it a lot. Uh, it, it can be used in a low depth fistula and a diameter uh, lower than 10 millimeters. The clinical success in the literature variable from 36 to 80%, and, but uh, it usually works better when you associate another therapy. Clips, the conventional clips do not work for fistulas and leaks, so never use it. It's just a waste of money. And the cap mountain clips can work when the defect is smaller than two centimeters. But always remember, when you close the defect, you need to have an external drainage when you have an uh, associate collection. Endoscopic suturing. I know a lot of people uh, like suturing for these cases, uh, but the literature shows that, it, that, it, that it is no reason to use it. So after one year, the, uh, almost all the defects are going to open again, especially in gastrogastric fistulas. So I do not use in our country. It's very expensive and the results are very bad. So I prefer not to use it. Stents, the results are quite good for the conventional stent. The clinical success is about 7%. However, the migration rate is very, very high. So nowadays, it's very rare when I use stents. I know most countries still use a lot, especially U.S., but we need to, to, to be very careful because when you have migration in these patients, uh, it's going to be very hard to treat them. The bariatric stents, uh, it comes as a promise to be the best approach for all patients, uh, especially after sleep gastrectomy. But this is our data. We have 37 patients in a multi-center study, and the clinical success was high, close to the conventional stents, 7-8%. However, the adverse event rates were extremely high, especially when you place in the post pyloric position, there is a lot of migration. So we didn't see any benefit compared to the other stand. So be careful when you use this kind of stands. Most interesting in this paper <clears throat> was our clinical success. As I said, it's about 95%. So when the, the stand failed, we use other techniques such as septotomy, 
uh, endoscopic internal drainage and endoscopic vacuum therapy, and our results were very good. This is also meta analysis comparing the stents, the bariatric versus the conventional stents. And again, as I said, there is no benefit in the literature about the bariatric stent compared to the conventional one. So be careful. Cardiac septal defect, defect occluded. I really like this device. So when you have a chronic or late uh, fistula, the results, the efficacy is about 97%. As you can see in this video, the way we do it. So uh, you place the stent in the epitalizer tract. It's a very strong state uh, with a very, uh, very strong radial force. So he's gonna keep that for, for a while. See, we just placed it when we inject contrast, there was no leakage. So at the same time you place, you treat the patient. And the other video is quite interesting because we did the follow-up of these patients because uh, the question is how long it's gonna keep that. And some patients keep forever. Uh, we never had a complication, but in this patient uh, especially, uh, the, the stent just migrated and the patient eliminated the stent. So it's a very interesting case. We also published our, uh, our case report using the cardiac septal occluder for gastrogastric fistulas. As I said in the, in the suturing device, uh, the endoscopy results for this kind uh, of fistula, it's not good. Just when you have a defect smaller than one centimeter, it can work. Otherwise, uh, surgical revision, when very well indicated, is the best approach. Endoscopic internal drainage with double pigtail. Uh, it's a very interesting technique, similar to pancreatic pseudosis. And the, the bigger experience is Donatelli, and he published he, his cases. And the clinical success is about 85%. And you see in the video one, one case that we did, so these patients who just placed the stents, uh, she went home and she became like, he, he, she came back after one month and she was doing okay. We just removed and dilated the, the sleeve with the, the, the pneumatic by low dilation. We just published recently, uh, we are now using the retro stents besides of the biliary stent because the retro stent is much more flexible. So we won't have complications such as perforation uh, and pain and bleeding. So we, re we highly recommend the use of the retro stents. Septotomy, uh, this is very, very important to know. So always when you have, you have a septum, you need to do the septotomy. Otherwise you won't close the, the, the defect or you're gonna close and it's gonna reopen later. So always do the septotomy. <clears throat> it's a pretty easy technique and it works very well. And in the sleeve cases, I, al I always like to dilate the, the sleeve after the septotomy. <clears throat> Endoscopic vacuum therapy, for those who know me, I really love this approach. Uh, we, we are working uh, in the, the modified endoscopic vacuum therapy. So what is, what is great about vacuum is the mechanism of action. So you have the micro deformation, micro deformation, and with that, you're gonna have, you're gonna have angiogenesis, so you're gonna improve the, the perfusion. And also with the vacuum, you can have exit control and bacterial clearance. So it's really good uh, technique. Of course, there is a discomfort of the patient with the nasal gas uh, tube, and you need more, more procedures, but it works very, very well for very severe cases. I, I, I really recommend it. So when you have a, a, a cap, uh, associate cavity collection uh, close to the orifice, you need to place the vacuum in intracavitary position. And when you don't have any collection, you can place intralumen. So the data in the literature is really good. Uh, here you see two papers, uh, clinical success 100%, but the problem is the number of sessions. See, you have 10 sessions uh, in the group. So it's a, it's a lot of procedures because the problem of the, the conventional sponge, the polyurethane sponge, is uh, you have the tissue growth in the sponge. So it's, it's hard to remove. Uh, and also it's very hard to place through the, through the nerves. Uh, take us a lot of time, so a lot of people don't like the vacuum due to the, the, the difficulties caused by the polyurethane sponge. So when you compare the two approaches, uh, uh, you have the, this modified, which is called open perfume, described by loss. So it makes the procedure much easier. So you have easy placement, you have a reduction in procedure time because it makes it very easy. And you can have a longer interval between the, 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 the EBT system. So as you see in this, pa in this paper, you have a very high clinical success and a low number of sessions compared to the, to the response. So I really like it to use uh, the, the other approach. 
And here is the, the cost effect for the 5BT that we describe it. So we have the nozzle enter, you can use a nozzle enter feeding tube, a gauze and an antimicrobial size of rate. So we publish on video GIE, you can see the video, we teach very, very in detail. And then you have this kind of open pore film. But to be honest, we try the open pore film and our approach is better. It's if, uh, it works better than the open pore and you have all the benefits of the open pore. So I really recommend, as you see in this case, a very huge cavity. We place it in the modified MBT and here's the final result. Uh, it's, it's really, it really works. We are publishing our data soon and the, the clinical success is higher than 95%. So here we also use the, the, mod, the modified the, the modify VT in a triple lumen tube because then we allow for nutrition and for drainage. So as the, in this case, you're gonna see, I just placed the stand in the intraluminal position and I, uh, I lived here for 15 days. So the patient was receiving food, drinking a clear oral diet. And after 15 days, when I went to a second endoscopy, it was completely closed. So I just removed the EVT. And more interesting, you're gonna see in the video, the EVT makes the, the, the angulation of the sleeve better. I don't know to explain how we are still trying to understand, but maybe when he, uh, when you have the, the scare of the lead, maybe it's gonna modify the, the angle. So it, it's really nice. Uh, this is a meta-analysis also performed by our group. And what we show is that stand, EVT is better than stand for upper GI defects. So I, I really prefer EVT than stands. This is a, a, a case showing a combined therapies because most of the times you're gonna need more than one therapy. So here we have the, the stenosis on the sleeve. We dilated this patient. She has a chronic uh, gas pleural fistula. And after the pigtail placement, the patient didn't go well. So we removed the pigtail to the pleurostomy and then we, we use the over the, the, the septal occluder. So after place the septal occluder, we were expecting everything perfect, but we have a, a leak with the contrast. So then we inject the, the glue and also place it I stand to, to try to help the, the over the scope clean. Then after four weeks, every week we inject cyanoacrylate through the pleurostomy in the, in the cardiac septal defect occluder. And after four weeks, you see a complete closure. So these patients did very, very well. And it's just to show sometimes we need combined therapies. This is a very good case. I didn't show the video because uh, it was select for, for the World Cup at DDW. So I think we are not allowed to play it. But here you see the defect. This patient today sleep. She had a complication and then she did a gastrectomy. And in the esophagus jejun anastomosis, you have a completely the high cyst. And here you see the, you are inside the cavity. Then we place an intracavitary and intraluminal drainage. I keep the external drainage closed, otherwise I cannot have the vacuum. But every time, uh, also, also a day, we clean it with uh, saline to the, the external drainage just to help the EVT. So sometimes this combined approach is really, really good. And then after the granulation tissue, the patient was like uh, 80 weeks in the hostel. We placed the, the retro pigtails stand and, and sent her home with an osmoenteral feeding tube. When she come back one month later, she had a stenosis. Then we place it a, met a metal stent to treat the stenosis. And finally, this is the final result. So this patient now, she's having a normal life and she, she's still visiting us every day. She's a quite nice person. This is showing that endoscopy uh, procedures can also have complications. So I was doing a, a pneumatic balloon dilation, nice leaf. And as you can see, I almost opened the stomach uh, uh, in the middle. So I tried to clip with hemoclips. Uh, I couldn't do the, from the, the intraluminal side. So I went to the cavity and I placed it like from external the clips just to, to get the, the approximate tissue. And finally, I placed the, the endoscopic vacuum therapy. So after one month, after 15 days, this pay, I removed the vacuum and this patient went home. And this is the follow-up after three months. So it's it's really good approach, even in a complication. And this is a video just to show that sometimes uh, we need to go with the surgeons. So this patient was a very bad condition. We placed the, the endoscopic vacuum therapy, the modified one. And after four days, uh, we went uh, with the surgeons. We find the limb. The surgeons find the limb and we placed a full cover metal stand. 
And after four weeks, the, the anastomosis was, was again very well. So it's also an option. So I, we won't have time because I just have 15 minutes and I need to talk about structures. And this is a, a summary for those who want to, to do a take screen, uh, a print screen. And we also published this yeah, just yesterday was published. So you can go here and find the, this table. This is our experience with these devices. Also with the covering techniques, we it's, uh, it's the same table. And here with draining techniques. So we talk about all the approach uh, based on our experience and on the literature data. And this is our algorithm. It's, uh, it's important to say there is no way to, to do a perfect algorithm. There is no way to do that. But this is almost what we do. So when the patient is very bad, surgical treatment is important to, to clean the cavity. But endoscopy is also an option, as I, as I show in the other video. But for me, the best approach when you have an unstable patient, the surgeons go clean the cavity and then uh, we endoscopy is going to treat the, the defect. For stable patients, for sure, endoscopy is the best treatment. And these are, are the options. So for late and chronic, you can use the cardiac septal defect occluder. And for acute, you can use the stent. But for, uh, for late and chronic, stents is not going to work. So don't use for chronic. Uh, most times, it's not going to work. And the cardiac septal occluder, you never can use in acute and early needs because it's very strong and it's going to open more the defect. And of course, always you need to treat the related factor. So most of the times it's now experienced stenosis. Now I'm going to talk about stenosis. Uh, uh, just going to go very quickly. So in who and I got by past gastric jejun stenosis, we can do hydrotrophic bilodilation, and we're going to have success 95% of, of the cases in about one to three sessions. The rate of adverse events is very, very low. But if you have, you just can treat by endoscopy. And for sure, it's the best approach. And when you have refractory structures, uh, you can use the lens. Uh, Chris Thompson has a, a, a large experience with that. Uh, it's, it's good. It's better than the conventional stand. However, the clinical success is 7%. So some patients will need to be, to be operated again. Uh, uh, rings leapage. So you, you have two techniques, the self expandable metal stand and pneumatic bilow dilation. I do prefer pneumatic bilow dilation because the problem of the stent is when you remove it, you're going to have stenosis in about 25% of patients due to the fibrotic ring. So I always go to pneumatic bilow dilation. When I can do that, I cannot do that, I go to stent. Both has a very, very high clinical success rates. Eroded gasket bending, so we don't have this a lot anymore. Uh, of course, you need to first cut the, the subcutaneous uh, part. And then you can do with a guide wire and a little trip device. You can cut the band, and after cutting the band, you can remove it uh, with a snare. So it's a it's a pretty nice technique and works very well. It's very safe. Cask ring. This is pretty pretty easy. Uh, in one minute, you can do you can remove it with a scissor or with APC. Doesn't matter. It, it's very very easy. It's liver stenosis. So sorry, I already talked a little bit about it. So we have two types of stenosis. As you said, uh, sometimes you can also use the CRE balloon, but I know people do it, but I do not recommend. I think we should always use the, the Acalasia balloon dilation. And when you have exo deviation, for sure you need to use the Acalasia balloon dilation. So this is what we do. Uh, as I said, I don't use the, the, the CRE balloon. I just use the pneumatic balloon dilation. So usually I start with 30 millimeters. I try a second time with 30 millimeters. If not work, I go to 35. Uh, I usually not go to 40. The perforation case was 40. So after that, I, I, I start to be more, more afraid of 40 balloon dilation. Uh, it stands. A lot of people try to use it. I also don't like it. As I said, there is a high rate of migration. So what we do now is the technique described by Chris Thompson, the endoscopic tennis with rotomy. And if it fails, then we send the patient to surgery. But most of the time, I think we, we can do that. Uh, just when you have like a completely twisted sleeve, surgery is better. So this is the, the video about endoscopic endoscopterostrotomy uh, created by Chris Thompson. So we inject it, uh, we do a submucosal tunneling. And then when we, we see the fibrotic tissue, we just cut it. And then at the end, we close the, the mucosal incision, similar to a G point. And then Eduardo Moura, here in Brazil, he, he copied the technique, but he did the, the full thickness myotomy 
a more aggressive approach. And to be honest, now we are doing the more aggressive approach and really works very well. So my conclusion, uh, I'm sure endoscopic targets are very safe and effective in the management of post bariatric surgical complications. Uh, we need to understand this is a complex patient and individualized approach is required. And you need to tell your patient most of the time more than one intervention is gonna be required. There is no data to, to support a precise algorithm for this kind of complications, but uh, the, uh, our summarized slide show it uh, like uh, it's like a guide to choose the best one. You always need to treat the, the factors related to the leak or the fistula, usually the stenosis. And of course, you need to consider your expertise when you when choose the best technique. And when you don't have the expertise or your hostel, uh, you don't have a multidisciplinary team, you need to refer this patient to a center of excellence. And of course, as I said, the multidisciplinary approach is essential. Uh, especially in leaks, these patients are very, very complicated. Uh, you need an uh, ICU, you need an uh, infectologist, uh, nutrition. So there is a, a huge team uh, close to this patient and, and you need to, to, be, to be part of it for sure. So I wanna thank you again for, for, for your time. And I'm gonna invite, I wanna invite you to the third belt. So this one was the second belt. We have more than 200, 2,600 people from more than 100 countries. And this year we're gonna do in September 30, and all the all the people who are giving talks here is gonna be doing live cases. So thank you so much.